Hello, this is Greg Gasson Green Greg. It's coming to you on the 30th of November, 21. Time on deck is 21.0200 hours Central Standard Time. And the war drums are beat between uh, Russia and Ukraine and potentially NATO. Never have we heard such wrecker since uh, the Cold War, maybe even the Cuban Missile Crisis. And this could be potentially worse, potentially. Uh, what we've got here, ladies and gentlemen, is a standoff that is escalating. The Russians have just proclaimed that they are going to deploy within a matter of weeks hypersonic missiles. They claim capable of Mach 9. They claim nuclear missiles on the border there with uh, Ukraine, maybe NATO, NATO countries. And this is a, clearly a threat aimed at NATO countries. And Ukraine has responded. President Zelensky of, the, of Ukraine has responded that, hey, we're going to fire back missiles at Moscow. You attack us, we're going to fire back. Although the, the Ukraine's missiles doesn't have quite the reach, they are threatening to hit nuclear power plants in Russian cities and Russian cities and targets. So they, they do plan to hit back. And this is a major escalation and could cause very nasty consequences in Europe especially if nuclear power plants get hit in a uh, conflict like this, which means that a non-nuclear state can essentially wage a semi-nuclear, at least a dirty nuclear war. Wow. This has got the smackings, the smackings of World War III. Well, a lot of us are thinking, well, why should we risk it over Ukraine? They're not a NATO nation. And so, you know, we'll, we'll be a lot of huff and puff and we won't do anything. And that may be true. On the other hand, uh, France and England have both made uh, seemingly pretty strong commitments to the Ukraine. And <clears throat> furthermore, they are NATO allies. And if they get attacked, then we are treaty bound to get involved. Now, uh, the uh, foreign secretary of the United Kingdom, Liz uh, Truss, actually uh, told Russia not to, uh, not to make the mistake of invading Ukraine, hmm. whatever that's supposed to mean. You know, it's kind of a veiled threat. But Russia's also been telling the West, do not cross these red lines. And they've been drawing red lines everywhere and say, do not cross these red lines. If you do, uh, you do so at great risk. You know, you'll burn kind of, kind of like language been used by China, a lot of stuff. You do this, you do that, you'll burn, blah, 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 blah. This is tumultuous times, guys. Um, also, there's a prospect that there could be maybe some treaties involved that, that Russia would be happy if certain negotiations would be made, but the Ukrainians don't seem interested in that. So maybe the lack of interest in negotiation, things that maybe should be negotiable, may be putting us all at risk of a nuclear inferno, or that's the worst case. What happens if it's not that? Uh, are we looking at further disruption of global uh, supply chains? And what if it's just between U uh, Ukraine and Russia? and a lot of nuclear power plants get hit and other exchanges like that take place, that it could still have worldwide ramifications in terms of radiation. And again, that could have, you know, the supply chains and other things in the world. And just, you know, uh, it could help tank our economies even further in the midst of everything going on. So where can this go? What's the root of it? Well, part of the root of it goes back to uh, Ukraine was originally a Warsaw Pact nation. Well, not originally but you know in the soviet area era uh it was under the sphere of the soviet union definitely within their sphere it was a it was an independent nation supposedly it was a nation but they were uh wholly controlled by the soviet union they were in the warsaw pact which means they had a defense pact with russia now some of those countries were forced into it because russia did invade some eastern european countries like czechoslovakia uh, most notably. So Russia's had a history of doing these kind of things in the past, which may indicate that they would do so again in the future. So Moscow, uh, you know, there's something to think about. Think about uh, Peter Vincent Pry pointed out something. You know, he's a, a friend of mine, Dr. Peter Pry. I've had him on the channel several times. He's a world-renowned analyst in uh, history, military systems, weapons systems, and EMP. And Dr. Pry points out that we in the West, uh, our politicians make the tactical error, the strategic policy errors, errors 
of considering that dictators in foreign countries think like we do, when in fact, they also make a similar uh, error. They're thinking that we think like they do. And we're not taking that into account. They think in terms of aggression and military activities, and they think we think in that manner. And we're thinking that's not the case, but it apparently is the case. What else would explain the bellicose threats coming from Russia? Russia has had a history of being invaded by the West in the past in World War II and during the Napoleonic era. And World War II is a particular sore point that they still celebrate their victory over the Nazis very happily. Uh, and so when you consider that, that Ukraine was their territory, I mean, they considered it to be uniquely Russian. They were tightly coupled with the Ukraine. And, you know, I've been in their big plaza in Moscow where they've got pavilions to every uh, Soviet era state. And the Ukraine had a really special position there. And I met a lot of Ukrainians when I was in Moscow. So you can tell there was a, a tight coupling there at one time. Now, some of these Ukrainians would be ethnic Russians, of course. Wow. So, um, but what happened was that the uh, Russians uh, had a president that was favorable to them in Ukraine getting elected. And we actually staged a coup that overthrew this president. And this president was, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, I think a minute. Uh, he was, but anyway, he was, uh, give me a second here, I have to think about this. This president of Russia, uh, no, excuse me, this president in the Ukraine was um, Yannick, uh, Yanukov <laughs> Yannick, uh, sorry, me say, Yanukovych, I believe is his pronunciation. Uh, president Yanukovych was elected democratically president of the Ukraine and was overthrown by our CIA because he was pro-Russian. That put Russia in a fit. And then Ukraine, as a result, was flirting with joining NATO, which threw Russia further into a fit. Now, the people of Western Ukraine don't want anything to do with Russia. And the people of Eastern Ukraine view themselves as predominantly Russian, especially in, uh, to the oblast there on the, the border of Russia, uh, Luhansk and Donetsk. Uh, so those two uh, oblasts are the center of this conflict. So this could go nuclear. This could become World War III. Even if it don't, it could be very extremely disruptive. I'll bring you this as part of my eyes wide open and head on a swivel series, guys, so that you will know that it is time to get ready. We're talking, they're saying they could have these, uh, Russia is threatening to have these missiles in the, on the border, these hypersonic missiles in just a few weeks, early 2022, January 2022, just after the new year. So ladies and gentlemen, you know, I highly suggest you get ready. I highly suggest you prep. I highly suggest you learn. Watch my videos on how to eat free from the weeds and the trees. Buy your uh, beans and rice. But remember, you know, those are big and bulky. So uh, the best food you can get if you had to bug out uh, and for long-term storage, when you bug in for portability storage and buried in caches is freeze-dried food. And I got a special. If you go to prepwithgreg.com, you can get $100 off a three-month supply of this at prepwithgreg.com. This is uh, from my Patriot Supply. If you go to prepwithgreg.com to get that special, $100 off three-month supply. You get breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You get three, uh, 2,000 calories a day with these guys. And then a, lot, a lot of the other competitors, they've not run out yet. A lot of the other competitors are running out. Supplies are getting short, guys, and prices are going up. Now's the time to get it while, you, while the getting's good because supply chains are in, and, and who knows what's about to be locked down, what's not going to be available. So I would highly suggest getting this kind of stuff while you can right now uh, because of the things we face. And this isn't the only thing we face, guys. <laughs> We're facing China. We're facing Iran. We're facing... Uh, uh economic unraveling big time right now and, and more shutdowns and internal strife external strife this nation is being challenged like we've never seen it before our society our culture our identity who we are is under extreme challenge now the best thing you can do to protect your family in terms of food is to consider buying this kind of food also to buy the beans buy the rice 
the big box stores have it. Go over and buy the canned stuff, buy the, uh, and learn the free edibles. But, you know, guys, uh, from the wild edibles, you're not going to get the calories. You're not going to get carbs. You're not going to get the, the proteins you can get from my patron supply. Uh, you can order different kind of meal packages there to include uh, protein meat packages. I've got a meat box here. I've shown it in some previous videos. Uh, and uh, Or you can get vegan, gluten-free. They have choices like nobody else. Uh, my patient supply is simply the best in long-term food supply storage, and they have uh, quantity unlike others, and they also offer 2,000 calories a day. Check it out. My patient supply, make you a winner. And let's get back to this. What happened? The CIA overthrew uh, the, the uh, pro-Russian president, and today, the current president of Ukraine, which is, you know, of that lineage that we install, is afraid there's going to be a coup against him. So they're looking at a coup against him, plus this border tension, uh, the missiles out there. And, you know, you put Belarus into this because Belarus is aligning with uh, Russia on it. And uh, some recent article says, well, the, Russia has a new surprise ally, Belarus. Surprise? Are you kidding me? What kind of knucklehead writes an article like that in a major newspaper? It's no surprise to that at all. Look at you go. Come on, guys. He is uh, Putin's sock puck, puppet, if anything. You know, he, he's he's playing Mr. Bad Guy, getting your fall uh, up in Tiff, and, and Putin can kind of sit back and pull his reins a little bit, pull his strings, and look kind of good in some regards. But look, Russia and Lekin Chico have weaponized the gas supplies to Europe. They have set the stage for a major disruption in Europe, European society. And, you know, they're playing them against gas supplies, against the immigrant crisis. They're, they're playing Europe hard. And, you know, in part, it's Europe's fault, especially Germany, for accepting and, and agreeing to be subservient for their energy needs to Russia. For the, the, you know, it gets cold in Europe. When, when you've agreed that your means of heating their homes, and that's going to come from the guys that may want to eat you, it's kind of like being chickens in the hen house and, and, and signing a contract with a fox that's watching it. Or, you know, the fox that owns it. You know, you, they, they look like chickens in a chicken house. I mean, seriously, guys, that's where Europe's at. And, you know, I guess the Putin is kind of licking his teeth. You know, looking at that chicken meat in uh, Western Europe. Uh, I say that facetiously, but, you know, that's it, not, unfortunately, too far removed from what might be the case. Now, uh, taking Europe would be hard, but some people are fearing that he may try to make a thrust into Europe. That was the old Soviet goal all along. But uh, they, we had deterrence to keep them from doing it. They had street signs made up of all the European streets and all the European cities throughout Europe. They had the street signs. <laughs> they, they fully had hoped that one day they would take all that. But they definitely want to take the, Balt the Baltic states back, which are NATO countries, maybe indefensible NATO countries. How do we react if Russia rolls over NATO members that are out of our reach to be able to respond to them before they're creamed? How are we going to react to that? Putin probably is looking at, well, guys, you never want to be weak in the face of a big bully. You're going to get bullied and pummeled anytime you're weak in the face of a big bully. What well, are they? We're looking weak. And suddenly, so all the world's players are taking advantage of that. They're stepping up. They're playing their part that they know they can get away with. They're taking the candy from the babies because they can. You know, that's the danger of being weak is that you get pummeled. So we should never be weak, but we have put ourselves in that position through various and sundry means and ways, which I will discuss at this point in time. I'm sure you can ascertain what they may be. Have that said, <clears throat> Russia is acting up. China is acting up. Iran, they don't want to negotiate with us, not unless we just lift all the sanctions first and then they don't negotiate. They're so close to getting what they want. They don't care. They don't care. They're almost there. They have lived through all these sanctions all this time. And Israel is just chomping at the bit to hit them because they don't let them get there. So, ooh, rough times. And it was Turkey and Greece who we were at it with each other over Cyprus and more. So uh, we have all the rings of war all over and around the entire Asian continent from North Korea to Japan and China, Taiwan and China, India and China, or Philippines and China, uh, back around Iran, uh, well, it was Afghanistan, 
Iran, back up through the Middle East. Uh, the whole area is simmering. So this is why you need to be thinking seriously about your preps and your family. Let me show you some gas models. I'm going to share a couple of them real fast with you. And then we're going to terminate this video. I got a lot to do here. Yeah, okay, here we go, guys. Let's try to blow this up. Ukraine ready to strike Russian cities and nuke plants as Putin reveals hypersonic missiles will soon be deployed in weeks. Weeks, guys. And here's the foreign, uh, former foreign minister of Vladimir Orensko and uh, warning that uh, Russian cities and power stations will be targeted. So this is the Ukraine here, and this is the oblast in Russia that border Ukraine. And here are the cities that they think they could target. Well, basically got two kind of weapon systems that uh, could target these. They've got an old Russian missile that's got about an 80 mile range. And they've got a cruise missile, anti-ship cruise missile, which they could use against land targets. It gives them something like, I believe it says 175 miles, let's say maybe, yeah, 80 mile range with a Soviet area, Tochka, Tochka. And they got this Neptune anti-ship missile, which has a range of 175 miles. So that's not a lot of depth, but it would be enough to, to bloody the nose of at least of the uh, oblast around Russia that border Ukraine. So that would be uh, definitely a bloody nose on the Russians. It wouldn't be strategic defeat, but it would definitely be a bloody nose. So, you, you know, the, the establishment in Ukraine definitely wants to hurt back if they get attacked. Now, we're going to look here. <laughs> no, we're not going to him. I met, <laughs> I met him a couple of times. Let's see. Uh, Russia's Ukraine. Well, well, well the, the, this is the hill. This is the paper you find on all the uh, cafeterias in, in Washington, D.C., underneath the congressional office buildings and, and uh, in the Capitol itself, the hill. Uh, it's uh, you know a pretty good newspaper in terms of uh, analysts of uh, events and things going on in the world. Uh, it talks about as the EU braces for cold winter, and what this, this the, the real crux of this article what it's saying is that Moscow is really wanting to negotiate, and Moscow and the options are that the uh, uh, the provinces of, of uh, Donetsk and uh, uh, Luhansk, it could be uh, perhaps still uh, independent states, more or less, uh, not quite in Russia, uh, considered Ukrainian, but operating totally autonomous. That's what they're trying to be somewhat, and Ukraine is resisting that, I guess. So that's what Russia would like, apparently, at the lowest level. Of course, Russia would like to totally annex them, but that's probably negotiable. And that's what they're suggesting here, but it also suggests that uh, Kiev, uh, that, you know, uh, would not want to negotiate. That the, the, the uh, uh, Ukrainians are not happy to negotiate this stuff. So if if Donbas were to become that's the overall area there, uh, an autonomous republic of the Ukraine, the region's influence in the Rada would diminish, so that Moscow wouldn't have as much power. While Moscow would retain its presence in the East, it would have limited influence in Western Ukraine. Such an agreement, if implemented, uh, if implemented, the, U the Kremlin would betray as a victory. So they could claim victory, but ironically, this compromise uh, would be in both countries' best interest given the current circumstances. So that's what clearly the, the, the analysts here in the Hill are in favor of, but it seems that uh, here's what their, their, their analysis says. Unfortunately, Ukrainian support for renewed political negotiations remain low and the terms of the Minsk Accords are highly unpopular. So because of that, we all may be facing a World War III. Hmm. Any political leader who would implement a similar agreement might secure the peace for Donbass and avert a military escalation with Russia, which would be very big, but would effectively be committing political suicide. You know, I would call that individual a statesman. They would do that. Unfortunately, there's very few statesmen left in the world today. Almost none in the world politics. Poles of ticks. Politics means many ticks. Uh, so ultimately, the Ukrainian government must decide what to do with Donbass before 
the prelim X unilaterally, which means that the Kremlin will strike out if nothing's done. And Donbass consists of both uh, both of these oblasts here. So I understand it. So we'll, we'll look at a map of the Ukraine here. Bing, bing, bing. So here's Donetsk and here's uh, Luhansk. And uh, the eastern part of Russia uh, has a lot more Russian people in it than Western. Now, this is a few Russians over here, lots of Russians over here. The farther you go east, the more ethnically Russian the area becomes. Um, let's see if I can click this map that goes to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. So uh, here's Kiev over here, where the capital is. So this nation is divided by a waterway roughly right through here. We'll see that in another map. Crimea has uh, been annexed by Russia. Uh, seven, seven, <laughs> seven, uh, seven, I can't pronounce that, is the actual military base there. I have to practice that. Uh, but anyway, so uh, these are the areas that have clearly, they're trying to be break the way uh, to go to Russia, supposedly. Um, Okay. Oh yeah, I got that map shown here separately too. Let's uh, kill these two files here. This is a map of how Russia, excuse me, how the Ukraine voted when uh, they had an election in 2012 between uh, Yanukovych party and uh, boy, how do you say that? Bat Bat Kiv. Yeah, I'm not even going to go there. This guy. <laughs> That is way beyond my own concern. If I heard it, I could say it, but I'd have to hear it. Uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> so these areas all were voting for the pro, uh, the Russian guy, mainly the guy who favored Russia. Now, maybe he wasn't expected to come out over as hard over as Russia as he did. But again, if you see, this is Eastern Ukraine, with some little exceptions, some other pockets that uh, voted along with them. And I guess this area had their own favorite candidate. So uh, this is this is the way it was split. I have seen various maps of Ukraine claiming uh, what the ethnic divisions are for Oblast, but I've seen maps that are diametrically opposed to each other in that claim. So whoever makes the maps was, tells a story the way they want to tell it. So I don't trust any of them, to be honest about it. But here, we can see where the conflict is centered right now. So there we go. That is what we're facing, guys, right there. It's not a pretty situation. Hello. We don't know where this is going to go. We don't know where it can escalate to. Uh, Russia considers this theirs. Oh, yeah, I just want to show one other thing in that. Let me go back. What we really think might happen here. Ah, and I shouldn't have shut down the map. That's what I really wanted to see, guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah here we go. Uh, but that's not the map I want to look at. Find one that shows the rivers. Oh, there we go. That's a better one for what I want to talk about. Here we go. It's likely that Russia would want to unify a land bridge between Crimea and Donbass area, which means that they would at least want to come through here. Also, Crimea has had issues getting water. Ukraine has cut water off to uh, Crimea. So the Russians will want some of this so they could assure they got water down here. So definitely, I would say these oblasts here, that this, these two are definitely what they're going to claim. If they launch an invasion, that's if. Now, they might negotiate for these guys having more autonomy, but since they don't seem to be in cards, they're likely to launch an invasion and come down through here. They may take all of this up here, too. Remember, this is the, this is the best region in Europe for growing food right here. Right here. This is the breadbasket. All of this in eastern Ukraine is in particular right down here because this is the warmer part next to the black sea uh this is top prime agricultural land 
Uh, it's all, uh, this area at least is, seems to be predominantly Russian. There seems to be a lot of favoritism to the Russian way through here. This is definitely predominantly Russian. So, and then I would say this, if a region really wants to go with Russia, let them vote. I say everybody should have the right to self-determination. If a state or old blast wants to go one way or the other, let them go. Let them go whatever. You know, say if Maine wanted to join Nova Scotia and they voted for it, let them go. I don't see that happening, but <laughs> you might see Quebec trying to join France. You know, considering all the concessions that Canada gave them to stay in the union, I would have had the opposite, you know, opinion if I were in Canada. I'd say, oh no, don't give them anything, kick them out. <laughs> Of course, the Eastern Canada, English speaking parts of Eastern Canada would have been physically separated from Western Canada. Some people thought that Canada would split in, into several nations if that happened, some of them joining. Some of the provinces joining the United States, particularly the Western ones, I don't know. It's a lot of conjecture, <clears throat> but back to the story here. Why are they fighting so hard over areas that they could negotiate over, especially people that had a vote, uh, you know, there's, there's it's all this obsession, possession that people have. It's mine, it's mine, you're mine, you're mine. You know, that we got to get our, and, and that's on both sides. But both sides are guilty of that obsession, possession. It's mine, it's mine, my precious. You know, this territory is mine. You know, both of them are saying this, you know, basically. Let the people within it decide for themselves, for Pete's sake, if they would. Crimea yeah, actually did that. They actually voted overwhelmingly. Yeah, uh, the West doesn't want to accept that. So there's room for negotiation right there. I don't know, you know, uh, but you know, the West is, is not accepting that. Uh, you, uh, you, uh, the United Kingdom and France are offering to back up Ukraine. I don't know how far they're going to take that. Will it, does that mean direct military action? I'm thinking probably not, but it could be. I mean, it sounds like the way they say it. Russia is definitely anticipating that we're going to get, get militarily involved, and that's why they're making the threats they're making. They figured that we're going to step in there to help Ukraine, or that we might. But the fact that they're willing to make it, maybe willing to make a chess move like this, may suggest that they that they they play they put enough bluster up that we won't do it. Also, all this could just be pressure on Ukraine to negotiate. So this may not boil over, but it could. It could easily do so. Time will tell. We may be in World War III, January, February. I don't know, guys. But I do know this. It's not the only hot spot. Russia's dying the Balkans. Uh, we've got uh, tensions with, uh, like I said, from Turkey and Greece. We've got tensions. Of course, that's always been a hot spot. We've got t tensions right now. Iran is really ratcheting up. North Korea, China, internal strife here in the United States. There's plenty to be prepping for. And then the whole supply chain unraveling, and then a new bug coming along. Whew. Yeah, we've got we got issues. And if things unravel too far, it may not, be, you know, this may be like Humpty Dumpty falling off the wall. If somebody takes down our power grid in the midst of all this, be it China, Iran, Russia, or some other entity, North Korea, whew, guys, we're done. We haven't gotten hardened yet. You know, some of us have been pushing real hard to make that happen. That's my power grid defense podium placard from two power grid conference, power grid defense conferences I chair. So guys, I do more than just come in here and talk and tell you to prep. I'm actively involved in trying to keep these things from coming to pass. Somebody Chris says, Oh, Greg, now your prophecies never come to pass. One, I'm not a prophet. And two, I'd really fight to keep them from coming to pass because I don't want to see that. But I know darn well you better be prepared in case of day because they're it's all too likely. There's too many things right there out here today that can get us. And then you look at <clears throat> a lot of it has come to pass, unfortunately. A lot of the things I said has already come to pass. You, know, you look at the supply plant, chain disruptions. You know, I did a, a video talking about how fragile our society is. I did a video talking about uh, you know, our nation's disintegration, talking about the way you know, if the workforce was uh, not participating, how, how bad things could get. And so I've already covered these territories and a lot of this stuff's already happened. It's coming about. I was one of the earlier reporters about the bug going around and, and, and shutdowns and things like that. So, yeah, okay. You know, fortunately we haven't had World War III. Was that, was that person dis disappointed that we haven't had a EMP or World War III? Wow. <laughs> 
uh, let's hope and pray that will happen. But guys, there's prophecy. Uh, what I do believe is, I mean, certain things seem to be in the prophecy, but you know, uh, Jonah had some way of, uh, of changing things by getting people to repent and doing his job. And furthermore, I believe we can change our ride through the bad times and personally uh, with prayer being properly centered and prepping. I believe all these things count to help maybe give us or our family, our loved ones, a little easier ride through the maelstrom. I mean, if you know you're going to go into a tornado, at least you'll, you'll know or a hurricane to bat in the hatches, right? If you know you're going to be in it for a long time, you better have everything you need inside. Just saying, guys. That's what prepping is. It's just getting ready. Is that a Boy Scout motto? Be prepared. <laughs> Riding and be prepared. Something like that. Oh, well, that's Cub Scouts, too, for this. Boy Scouts. I can't do that. I, that end, I do it with this end. <laughs> I can't, my fingers won't form with this hand. Ah! <laughs> I can't straighten them out. <laughs> can't with this hand. That's odd. I'm right handed, but my, I got more dexterity in my left hand for some reason. Don't know why that is. <laughs> Alrighty, guys. We face awful times, potentially. Just make sure you're centered right with your maker, that you tell your loved ones you love them every chance you get. And because you never know when's the last time, get prepared as best you can. Start now. Take it serious. At the worst case, guys, you've got an investment in food inflation. You got an investment in the future. So I'll save you a ton of money. Make the best investment you can make, financially speaking. You know, until the grid goes down and Bitcoin goes poof, all that money in your bank accounts goes poof. You still got what you acquired. <laughs> if somebody hadn't come took it from you. Oh, yeah, self-defense. You got to bear that in mind, too. Anyway, band together with your friends and family. But as always, what I tell you in the end is that as, as, dark, as light dispels dark, love dispels hate. Let's shine your love light in the world. Let's see if we can make it better one person at a time. Let's get that started. Anyway, thank you for watching, and have an awesome week. Greg out.